street level. New York City is bricks and concrete, pigeon droppings, and congested thoroughfares. But zoom out or look up and you'll see it. New York is the premier skyscraper city in the world. New York's skyline is instantly recognizable, and yet it's changing every day as the city continues to build itself up. And the women and men whose hands place the pieces and whose legs climb the columns know just how risky a business it is. I Googled it, and it said that it was like one of the most dangerous jobs in the country. But building here comes with its own particular set of challenges. New York City is obviously one of the most dense urban environments on the earth. New York has subways underground that you have to be careful of. We have adjoining buildings. New York is much more congested than some of the other areas that I've worked. You know, so there's a lot more that has to be taken into account. There's a lot of pre-planning that's involved from everything from where we put the hoist to where we put a crane to how we do things, where a tower crane in this case is. All that takes, you know, it's months of planning. There's never enough space, ever. And yet, New York's ambition is insatiable. There are so few places left to build in New York. You have to create land in this particular instance, right? Or you have to take something down. Skyscraper construction is a team sport. And on the job sites of New York's tallest new buildings, the city's skyscraper raising prowess is on full display. This is how NYC builds its skyscrapers from bottom to top. In spirit and structure, New York City and skyscrapers are irrevocably intertwined. New York is both the kind of original skyscraper city, but it's also the kind of the continuing evolution of the history of the skyscraper that you can see play out here. The term skyscraper dates back to the 1880s or so, but it had precedent in things that were very tall, and that's what it meant. It meant the topmost sail of a, of a sailing ship. It meant a particularly high top hat that a man might wear, a stovepipe hat. It meant um, a, a horse that was particularly tall. So that idea of a silhouette against the skyline is the thing that people think of in their mind's eye when, when they hear the word skyscraper. So not high rise, not tall building, but skyscraper gives you a sense of verticality and of uh, kind of singularity of silhouette. And the skyline is a whole bunch of verticals interrupting a horizontal plane. By the, the 1910s, the Woolworth Building and other buildings are 30, 40, or 50 stories tall. And then the next um, kind of proliferation of buildings at that same height that really define what we think of as the skyline of New York in the, in the boom of the 1920s, those would be 40 or 50 stories, and the Empire State Building, 80 stories. The greatness of New York is perhaps most spectacularly seen in its buildings. For here on the island of Manhattan is the most impressive concentration of stone and steel masonry the world has ever known. Today, the city ranks third in the world on the list of cities with buildings over 150 meters or 492 feet tall. To many, the city might seem to be at full capacity, and yet 19 tall buildings remained under construction in May of 2022. News outlets have called this recent phenomenon the skyscraper boom. The development of the high-rise is really the kind of characteristic uh, invention of New York that is absolutely an expression of its economy, its energy, its diversity, and all of these, these factors that drive the city in both its expansion but also its concentration. Over the course of history, Technological advances and economic fluxes have worked in tandem to change skyscraper construction as a process and a concept. Okay, so here, they're setting the curtain wall on what we call the crown, which is the area above the roof. So they have a monorail system up around the top of the crown, and they pull the panels off of a lower floor and vertically they set them. So that panel is gonna come up and they're gonna 
Pretty sure they're gonna walk it over here and sit it right next to this one. Facade work at 2 Manhattan West, a 58-story office tower, was coming to a close in April 2022. If we come right here, So they pull them up from one spot, and then they walk them over, and then they set them in place. So we are about halfway, a little more than halfway done. Again, you can't be scared of heights, right? But the work starts long before a single beam is secured. You can't even start shovel and ground until you have your design completely worked out. You know exactly what the building, how strong it is, how tall it is. A developer will work with architects and engineers, as well as bankers and other people who uh, help uh, ensure construction processes uh, conducted properly. Builders in New York play by the city's rules. Strict building codes enforced by the city's Department of Buildings set the parameters for what is possible. New York City has a great deal of regulations you have a bunch of ideas and you start to work through them. I mean, architecture takes time to figure out. 99 of your ideas don't work and you just keep working through them for the one that does. Plans for the Brooklyn Tower, the super tall mixed use building that stands as the tallest in the borough, came together quickly. Pretty early on in the process, we had this idea of the interlocking hexagons and then you could see the way the setbacks kind of go up in a spiral. And by putting all the texture on the side, it makes those two sides turn solid. And that gives the building this gravitas on the skyline. In the early stages of a build, the glimmer and glamor of a spot on the skyline doesn't exist. At 100 Flatbush Avenue, a 482-foot tall skyscraper passed New York City's extensive permitting process and is now in the early stages of construction. We need an excavation permit to do the excavation. We need a supportive excavation permit, which is the, this structure you see here that keeps the road from falling into the job. And we need our foundation permit. Permits protect both the workers on site and the public. In a crowded city, builders will put up fencing and take over sidewalks and roadways, measures that protect people below from the hazards of a job site. Once crews are allowed to work, the excavation phase begins. This means lots of digging and literal tons of cement. 650 cubic yards. All right, so we'll have a pump down at the end. You see the, the chutes that are diagonally coming in from the roadway. We'll pour concrete into those, and then the workers down below will help spread it around. So we'll go through somewhere around uh, 16 concrete trucks in an hour, continuous nonstop until we finish the port. That foundation is supported by thousands of pounds of rebar, bars of steel that reinforce concrete. So it helps reinforce the steel. If it were to break or to crack, it holds it together. It adds, it adds flexibility where concrete is very rigid and it, you know, it, it has no flexibility in it. So the rebar gives it flexibility. New constructions in prime locations boast easy access to New York City's extensive transportation infrastructure. But during the construction process, a nearby subway line is a liability. We're standing on top of a subway tunnel right here that you can see is right along the, along the roadway. You also have some existing infrastructure, and so there's a lot of work that goes into you know, getting your permits, getting your sign off, getting people to check to make sure that, you're, you know, that isn't gonna be a problem. Proximity to a subway line means that crews cannot let the building settle. The building generally will settle, not a lot, but I mean, they'll settle anywhere, you know, from a couple of inches or, or, or so once you start loading on top of this. And when you're building a high rise, as you start putting the weight of the exterior shell and everything on the building, it'll come down a little bit and settle to a final resting point. This foundation has a design, a settlement reducing design, about 150 piles that are drilled into the ground. And what that does is, I mean, you can think of it as a, just a bunch of individual sticks sticking up. And when you try to push down on that, all of them by friction are stopping that building from moving down. Subways and train tunnels are a common obstacle for NYC builders. 
The builders of Manhattan West especially can attest to that. This was one of the very first sketches about in, on this project. As we had the opportunity to really look at the sites over train tracks, one of the very first questions was really about, we have to create land and how to put these buildings on top of this. Train lines were a selling point for the builders of two Manhattan West, a complex decades in the making that sits in close proximity to Moynihan Train Hall, Penn Station, and the Port Authority bus terminal. We really saw an opportunity here to do a similar idea, creating a neighborhood anchored over trains that, that transformed and expanded New York City urban district. New York is short on one thing, land. And while the city has expanded itself over the years, space is hard to come by. To make construction possible, builders had to get creative. Yeah, when we showed up and met with the railroads, you know, the first thing they said was, no problem, you could build here. You've got two hours every other Sunday. And we're, you know, building a very large complex. Obviously, you're not going to be able to do that with a, a two-hour time frame. So we came up with this system where we made a custom piece of gantry crane. The bridges consist of 16 decks made up of 56-ton segments. They were built and assembled while thousands of people passed below the active site each day. And this gantry crane would assemble segments of precast concrete next to each other and then post-tension them using steel cables, um, creating a bridge. Then it would lift the bridge and then in two hours on the overnight, it would slowly lower that 240-foot bridge or span into position. If we couldn't do this particular system of installing bridges, we'd st probably still be down there. It'd probably take more than 10 years using two hours at a time trying to put foundations and steel and columns in. This deck allows trains coming in and out of the city to pass underneath the building. These portals, right, if you, if you go up against them and look straight down, you might be able to see the tracks depending on how close the spans are, but they have like soot, they're like dirty. So I, we walked some attorneys through here with like these cashmere coats, they all came out looking like leopards, you know what I mean? <laughs> These are 240 feet from end to end. They're made up of individual segments about six foot wide. You can make out the seams on each side, right? And this is the birth date of this particular segment. You have to create land in this particular instance, right? Or you have to take something down. So it's unique to New York City, maybe some large cities, you know, to, to use these atypical sites for construction and for development of large scale projects. Henry met the project with skepticism. Could crews really build over an active railroad with such small pieces of land surrounding it and on such a large scale? It seemed like, you know, so far-fetched to be able to build over an active railroad. I, I'm not sure I could completely express I was like, no way, you know, we can actually build in this particular environment. Working through New York's characteristic obstacles requires a unique set of skills cultivated over generations by the city's famed iron workers. You know, people say that, you know, your job doesn't define you, and it doesn't, you know, but something about being able to build buildings makes me really proud of myself. And just knowing that, like, you left a mark. You know, like, we're making a difference. We're building New York. As an iron worker, Kasha is a member of Local 40 a group that puts recruits through a rigorous training process to prepare them for work on construction sites. So we're structural iron workers, that big heavy steel, the bridge work, we do a lot of that work. So there's not a lot of uh, what people might consider light duty. Pretty much everything we do, you need to have some strength and some durability. I get these cuts on me and the scrapes on me. Like, but like I said, I love working with my hands. I love my career. I wouldn't change it for the world. Workers weld, climb columns, walk beams, and transport tools and materials. The job comes with built-in hazards that make vigilance a prerequisite. It's fun, it's also very dangerous, and that's why we have to stay safe. Like, it's so important, you know, and luckily in school, they teach us how to do that, you know, how to, how to make sure that we're doing the next right thing, looking out for our partner, looking out for ourselves. You need to be aware of your surroundings. Now, if there's a piece in the air or like a bundle that they're getting off a truck, so it's a bunch of steel together, that are taking off the truck and putting on the job site, you don't want to be under that load. God forbid something happens, something, something snaps or the load closes up and you don't know what's going to happen. So you have to be aware of what's over your head at all times. If there's anybody working over your head, 
you don't want to be there. It's a three-year training program. It's pretty competitive to get into. We do our recruitment process every two years, and on average, we get between 3,600 and 4,000 people to pick up an application for 200 spots. So it's kind of like getting into Harvard, I would say, for the, for the building trades. Recruits take a written exam, and those who pass get called to take a physical test. Climbing a column, lowering a bucket of bolts, walking on a beam, carrying a tool up and down flights of stairs, and operating a hoisting mechanism called a chain fall. This block helps you pull up, like whatever, a ton. You know, so I, I personally can't lift a ton. I could probably like lift a few hundred a little bit. The task, like many on a skyscraper construction site, is physically demanding. And during the local 40 exam, it's not a team effort. When you're taking tests, it's just you. But when you're in a job site, and let's just say you have to go, like, I don't know, 60 feet or whatever, or you have to go, like, two stories with this chainsaw, like, and it's a huge beam, right? It's a like humongous. Um, you go on it, you go as much as you can, and you don't want to let go. You want it. You want to get that piece in the air. You want to be the person that gets that piece in the air. But you're, you start sweating a little bit. You know, it's been, like, four minutes, you know, whatever. whatever. It's been a little bit of time. You're sweating. Your heart's racing. And your partner will come up to you. He'll just, like, get you out the way. He'll try to get the chain fall out of your hands, and he'll help you, you know? Throughout the construction process, workers on a skyscraper transport material via hoist. We build this common platform with these six hoist cars to get the men and the material up to the work floor. Uh, so this is our lifeblood. And what happens eventually is we build the interior elevators. At some point, we will remove this hoist and we will use the interior freight cars. At two Manhattan West, Crews were pulling the final pieces of the facade into place. We'll take that hoist down, we close the facade up, and then we finish the site work and we finish the lot. So that's really the last, last thing that we do when we're walking out the door. Skyscrapers are perhaps New York's most visible form of change. The city's newest, tallest buildings add shapes to a skyline so familiar, contributing form and function to a city that already has it all. Most people think that the skyscraper gets taller and taller and taller, and that somehow the motivation for the building is technological or it's ego. It's driven by a desire to, to, to create the tallest buildings. We occupy tall buildings because they're an efficient use of land, because there's demand for the space, because there are many uses that make them practicable, that make it possible to live in cities and to use mass transit and to be efficient the way that cities create efficient and hopefully sustainable places to live in a way that, that really point to the future in with a solution and a strategy that makes sense to use our resources well across time. But as New York continues to build taller, architects and engineers must assess the impact their buildings have on the city. It's a privilege to build a tall building in the city, and when you do it, it's going to last for 100 years, and it needs to respond to the current environment. In 2019, emissions from building operations and construction reached an all-time high. But the worst culprits are high-rise buildings, which create a larger carbon footprint. Some of the city's oldest towers, like the 91-year-old Empire State Building, are being retrofitted, while some of the city's newest buildings are looking at new ways to stay sustainable. When complete, Brooklyn's 100 Flatbush development will stand as one of the city's greenest buildings. We need to dramatically change the way we build buildings, the way we operate buildings, so that we can effectively respond to the threat of climate change. Alongside its brownstones, Brooklyn, too, is building a skyline, one that could someday rival Manhattan's.
It used to be that Manhattan had the skyline and the rest of the boroughs were the kind of bedroom communities or, or, or nodes of neighborhood development that weren't high rise but were residential. Brooklyn, of course, famously over the last couple of decades, and especially since 9-11, has really developed its own skyline. And that skyline is principally residential buildings. Brooklyn has for many years had very important landmarks, but they've been less visible from afar. I think this building says, hello, I'm here. Known for its diverse population of people, New York City's willingness to juxtapose comes through in its architecture. Buildings in New York are the kind of art that often lasts. Newer, taller buildings coexisting with those that predate them. And you have an incredibly rich and diverse catalog of historic buildings that really kind of give a great texture on the street. If you have a super tall building sort of behind the landmark building or integrated with the landmark building, it, it really gives this kind of great uh, read of the buildings on different scales. Because on the street, you're relating to the historic building, but on the skyline, you see the tower. And so integrating those two together is a really interesting way to put density uh, in the city. And for those who build them, the process itself is often childhood dreams come full circle. I'm used to being on job sites. Tiny job sites, you know, like a one-bedroom apartment job site. So when I got into the union and there were these huge buildings, um, you know, I walked in and I was just like, whoa. For me, it seemed like it was like big time, you know? I think when I was born, I think, you know, instead of them putting a little hat on your head to keep you warm when you're an infant, I think they put a hard hat on my head. I, I think that was like uh, what got me starting to think about what I wanted to do at that age, which may sound kind of crazy, but it's in my blood. I'm a kid that grew up in the boroughs of New York City. I was like a Lego maniac. I remember the first World Trade Center being built, and I had a model of the Trade Center in Lego, and I, and I did it, and I could see the skyline from my bedroom window, and that our firm, and that together we've been able to make a mark on that skyline is an incredible achievement. I'm, I never take it for granted. I'm excited about it every day. Something about being able to build buildings makes me really proud of myself in some, in some very strange way, you know, and um, it's, I can't explain it, you know, just leaving this huge mark. And nobody will know it's me in like 100, 200 years. Nobody's going to say, oh, gosh, I put in this beam. They're not going to know, but something about just helping build New York just really just drives me, just really drives me. A job in New York City construction comes with constant potential to climb. And with its skyline ever evolving, New York City will never be finished building.